Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hausmann, for this uh, very uh, kind and, may I say, precise and very positive uh, introduction uh, explaining what is Europe and, in particular, from the view of uh, somebody being outside or still outside, uh, like uh, the Albanians. Second, uh, what I see reminds me very much on Brussels. Uh, uh, one is speaking and the others are eating, which is uh, very okay for me. Uh, so I have no, uh, this is uh, not something special. It's, uh, we are used to that. But believe me, there are also some breaks in between, between breakfast, lunch and dinner. Uh, so coffee or so. Uh, but uh, seriously, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, maybe a little bit explain. Uh, I don't know if everybody is familiar with these uh, sometimes uh, complex structures of the European Union. So we have three relevant bodies. So one is the European Council, which is, uh, so to say, um, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the organization of the member states. Second, uh, we have the European Parliament, which gained more and more rights and, uh, uh, so to say, co-decision rights in particular. And then we have the European Commission, when uh, uh, these European insti uh, institutions were founded, member states um, avoided uh, uh, to say that the Commission is a minister in order not to create the impression these are super ministers. So that's why they decided uh, to call us commissioners, which is internationally well known. Everybody b believes we are policemen, but we are not. Uh, sometimes we are seen as the guardians of the treaty, so in that, in that kind we are a little bit like uh, policemen, but uh, 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 the European Commission takes care about, uh, so to say, the respect of the treaty. But more than that, we are now uh, in a more operative way, and it's in particular the Commission which has the right of initiatives. So, for instance, this is a, a very long-lasting debate with the European Parliament because, different to probably all the other parliaments in the world, the European Parliament doesn't have a right of initiatives. Yeah? But the right of initiatives to come forward with proposals is with the European Commission. But, of course, the Parliament, but also the Council, can task us, can ask us, to come forward with a particular initiative. And there are certain procedures. If, um, uh, so to say, we disagree with the proposal of one of our co-decision makers, uh, we have to explain why we are doing so. If we are coming forward with an initiative, uh, it's finally, to make things not too complicated, up to our two decision makers, the European Council, which is, so to say, the Council of the Member States, and the European Parliament to agree about this initiative and then it became uh, uh, European law and uh, with all the further consequences. This only to explain a little bit uh, our structure. The European Commission consists of 28 commissioners. Each country uh, is, uh, has nominated one commissioner and then it's up to the president of the commission to decide about the different dossiers and I'm in charge, as it was already said, for neighborhood and enlargement negotiations. What does it mean? I'm in charge of countries in the eastern neighborhood, which is uh, from Belarus, uh, 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 it's Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Georgia, Armenia, and uh, Azerbaijan. And in the south, it's from Syria till uh, Morocco. And then uh, enlargement negotiations affect Turkey, and uh, six countries in the Western Balkans. And um, in theory, I am also in charge of relationship with Switzerland, Norway, and uh, some other little um, countries, not some others, there are really little countries in Europe like uh, Monaco, Andorra, San Marino, etc. And uh, in the last couple of months of my uh, uh, mandate, I am probably also in charge of United Kingdom. Uh, so, but this is mainly the, for my uh, successor. Uh, only to give you uh, an idea about uh, the responsibility, and I will come back on this, uh, uh, so to say, in, in the course of uh, uh, the speech. Uh, but I also would like uh, to say it's, it's, it's really 
an honor to be here and to share with uh, you some of our thoughts and uh, our challenges and uh, it hopefully contributes to a better understanding about, so to say, our ideas, our thinkings and our, let's finally say it, uh, decisions. Uh, why we come up uh, with uh, um, one or the other uh, decision and it's always good to have an exchange with the academic uh, as a practitioner and may I say as a former Minister of Science and Research I have a particular, um, so to say, close relationship uh, to universities and to the academia. Um, and, and therefore, may I say, it's a particular pleasure um, and in a kind relaxation after a very, um, uh, so to say, busy uh, and hectic week in New York at the UN General Assembly to be here with you and to discuss uh, some hopefully very future-oriented uh, questions. But before I share some uh, uh, thoughts on my work, which is uh, basically about supporting uh, our neighbors' uh, development, let me confess uh, one thing. When I entered uh, the office as uh, uh, the European Union Commissioner for Neighborhood Policy uh, three years ago, almost three years ago, I felt rather uncomfortable with the definition of development, which underpinned our work in the regions to our unions east and uh, south. Um, and this for essentially two reasons. Uh, building on my uh, previous work in international business, uh, because I had also, so to say, a life before politics. Uh, um, uh, um, in, in the US it's not unusual, but in, in Europe or in some countries in Europe it's rather unusual that uh, a politician had a, a life before being a politician, so I was in business, uh, um, <coughs> leading an international entertainment company, so there was not a big difference to politics. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, um, I was uh, previously in charge for the European regions. Europe consists of 275 regions, and I was dealing with the regional and urban development of uh, Europe. Um, so, coming back on, on this issue of, uh, so to say, uh, the definition of development, I thought we are not uh, sufficiently uh, zooming in on the very fundamentals of uh, development. Some of them we took uh, for granted, like functioning the stable public institutions or key ingredients of economic growth. Other new challenges didn't uh, really feature sufficiently high on our agenda, like demographics or energy efficiency. And second, we were on a strategic uh, quasi autopilot. We assumed that uh, by letting the power of attraction of the European Union run its course, the political and economic and even societal transformation of our neighbors would be more or less automatic and just a matter of time. Especially the Arab Spring gave us high hopes in this regard. Political gravity, we thought, worked only in one direction. Our partners would become uh, close friends and all would move closer into our orbit, be it at uh, different speeds from Serbia to Syria, from Algeria to Azerbaijan. Brussels, uh, believe it uh, or not, had become a shining city on the hill for some, and uh, Professor Hausmann referred to it, even those who are already closer. Uh, and vice versa, development itself has become uh, a somewhat dubious, old-fashioned, even discriminatory. There are those who heroically struggle with deeply rooted problems with mixed uh, success. <coughs> so to borrow from Johnny Cash, we wanted uh, to build a ring of friends around Europe, uh, but today we are facing a ring of fire, at least partly, not uh, totally, but partly. It's unfortunately true. Therefore, I had to recalibrate uh, our approach to development uh, to address these uh, deficits. By going back to the basics and uh, using our power of attraction more intelligently, for the Western Balkans, who have a very firm perspective of joining the European Union, but also all others. By focusing on fundamentals relentlessly, the rule of law, economic competitiveness, which includes education, and connectivity as many of our neighboring regions 
are too isolated. By helping our partners in very basic stabilization instead of jumping ahead. And last but not least, sometimes by taking a step back and asking very realistically <coughs> what our partners' real ambitions and capacities are, rather than imposing a European reform menu from the outside. Let me add a thought that might seem strange for many Americans. There is a type of Euro-masochism, a navel-gazing tendency to blame ourselves for things that go wrong, which also affects our foreign policy. As if the European Union were the root of all evil, not just domestically, as uh, the Trojan horse of globalization and the prison of strong sovereign states, but also in its neighboring regions. As if Europe had triggered massive migration movements. As if we have uh, provoked the terrible wars that are ragging in our vicinity. The result of that is, at least in some quarters, uh, longing uh, for a kind of splendid isolation, which I understand uh, became public also in other parts of the world, <laughs> skillfully exploited by populists of all persuasions. My point is exactly the other way around. Rather than being the root of the problem, the European Union can be part of the solution to many of the development issues in our neighborhood. Secondly, helping to tackle these uh, challenges is not a matter of choice. It's a political imperative. We can't simply wall ourselves in. We need to reach out. Again, this might be different to other parts of the world, but a robust, really European foreign policy with a smart development toolbox at its center is not the icing of the cake of European integration, it's a bare necessity. If we don't actively export stability, security and opportunities, we are bound to import instability and insecurity. Europe doesn't have the geopolitical luxury of being protected uh, by two oceans. It's simply smarter and more effective to invest in our neighbors' resilience and help them with their political and socio-economic uh, challenges, rather than waiting uh, for the collateral damage uh, to hit us. And certainly, this uh, imperative of upping our game in the neighborhood actually helps to make the case of Europe uh, to our citizens. Shaping the peace, prosperity, and security of our neighbors and us ourselves is one of the key arguments for stronger European integration in the 21st century. Ironically, when you look uh, at opinion polls, you see that our citizens has grasped uh, that faster than some political leaders uh, in the EU member states. We are, after all, the largest trading bloc in the world producing nearly a quarter of the world's GDP with only 7% of uh, global population. We have, despite all issues, maintained a massive quality of life. We are the biggest uh, trading partner of more than 80 nations in all corners of the globe, and we are the biggest donor of development aid. <coughs> Sorry, and I'm not really used to air conditioning. <laughs> so, there is no need uh, to be shy, but we must leverage our power more intelligently. Let me illustrate that uh, with a few examples from my daily work. I will start with the broader neighborhood. This arc of instability from Eastern Europe through the Middle East and Africa. Sometimes it looks like uh, someone played a cruel joke with the part of the world, given its combustible mix of internal problems and uh, foreign meddling. My conclusion uh, for our policy has been that we need to look at stabilization as the very basis for development. In other words, what can we do to help fundamental stability politically and economically, but also regarding security before we embark on more complex sector-specific reforms. As I said, 
over the last decade and a half, we sometimes got ahead of ourselves. We became believers in legalistic modernization instead of acknowledging how complex the transformational development process of our neighbors was. As uh, one of my predecessors, Lord Patton, rightly said, democracy is not an instant coffee. The same applies, uh, by the way, to market economies. A related point, we need to work in a more joined up interdisciplinary fashion. It may be needless to say this here, but in politics, we sometimes risk falling into a silo mentality, going uh, for the flavor of the day than for the bigger picture. For example, looking at Egypt only through the prism of migration, at Algeria only through the diameter of a pipeline, or at Ukraine only from a peacekeeping and security perspective uh, would lead to wrong, short-sighted uh, policy choices. The same applies uh, for the internal development dynamics of these countries, including uh, the very advanced ones. They are equally interlinked. Deep democracy, worthy of that name, cannot function without uh, the rule of law. It doesn't finish at the payload box. A purely procedural approach to democracy would simply mean rubber stamping uh, the status quo, ultimately letting uh, the powers that be capture their states, a phenomenon to which some parts of the region I deal with are unfortunately dangerously close. Arseniy Yatsenyuk, uh, the former prime minister of Ukraine, once said to me that uh, the real problem for his country, and uh, I suppose it's not only his country, we are not the big fish, but the democratization of corruption. It's pervasive nature on all levels that makes it gradually socially acceptable. He had a point on this. That is why we need a comprehensive approach to good governance. The same holds for a functioning market economy. This is exactly the challenge for many of our neighbors. Functioning markets are not only an issue of trade, liberalization and privatization. They are about breaking regional and local monopolies and cartels through the basic rule of law backed by credible, strong institutions. That includes, by the way, tackling smaller scale media monopolies into which I'm currently having a particular look because they can do so much harm to open societies. I'm sometimes accused to being a sponsor of stability uh, of favoring and actually worsening uh, the status quo because by the very nature of my job, I have to deal with elected leaders of my client uh, countries. That is of course rather simplistic nonsense. Uh, politics is not, uh, I have to say, fantasy football. But there is a lesson to be heeded. Stabilization must not mean supporting the fake stability of the past either. Our partner countries paid dearly for that. It means tackling the real political and socio-economic roots of the problem. Stabilization means in particular prioritizing socio-economic uh, development, employment and employability, including uh, in many countries, in particular in the South, vocational training, are key to tackling many of our shared challenges, including migration and radicalization. Instead of an arc of instability, I want to build a belt of uh, prosperity around Europe. So maybe some of you might think I'm insane, uh, or it's uh, unrealistic to, to be polite. But it's uh, the only alternative for us. Because if you look today around Europe, you will see that we have 20 to 25 million either migrants, refugees, or internal displaced people around Europe, in the east, but mainly in the south. And there is a, if you like, daily risk that many of them might come to Europe. They also like to come to Europe because the gap between the welfare in the European Union 
and the immediate neighborhood is too big. Ukraine and Poland, just after the fall of the Iron Curtain, had more or less the same level of uh, GDP. Today, Poland is uh, three to four times better off than Ukraine. And already today, there are 800,000 um, Ukrainians living and working in Poland. And uh, in Ukraine itself, they are, due to the conflict in the east of the country, 1.5, 1.8 million internal displaced people. So if we are not working on reducing this welfare, welfare gap, we keep uh, a constant pressure not to see a threat uh, on, on, so to say, on Europe with all the consequences. So in our own interest, we have to address this issue. And therefore, I hope it's less than a vision, but it's, a, so to say, a must to create this kind of uh, uh, belt of And by the way, I think the people in these countries deserve it. They have the same rights, they have the same uh, so say, living conditions, possibilities, opportunities, like we have it. And uh, in that respect, I feel a moral obligation. And this, uh, in particular, is something which uh, affects very much um, the young generation. We are facing a lot of brain drain, also inside the European Union, and in particular by young, dynamic, uh, well-educated people. Uh, but there is another challenge. Uh, everything is related to each other. And this is uh, the population growth in some of our neighboring countries. May I take Egypt as an example. There we have every day, every day, 7,000 people more. Um, that means every year 2 to 2.5 million inhabitants more. Can you imagine the impact on a society, on infrastructure, on everything, uh, if a country is growing with such a dynamic. Egypt has quadrupled its uh, population in the last uh, 60 years, and the people are still living at the same uh, size of the country, meaning 5% of the whole territory. And one of the consequences is that in all the Arabic countries, the energy consumption is increasing every year by 6 to 8 percent, which means a doubling in around 10 years, and this is not sustainable. That's why, you might remember, I was talking at the beginning, we have to address the issue of energy efficiency. This is, of course, something which is related, of course, also to uh, climate goals, but it has also a very concrete impact on the stability of a society if you are not able to provide the necessary energy um, and this is also related to the fact that in these countries, in these societies, people are used that electricity bills are heavily subsidized. But this subsidizing is not sustainable because many of these countries are, so to say, relying on a business model which is linked to a certain level of oil and gas price. And for some years, this oil and gas price is far below, so to say, the business model. And this creates tensions because societies have to change their model. Saudi Arabia, as an example, or a country I know a little bit better, Algeria. In Algeria, they haven't raised the fuel price for more than 20 years because it was simply always subsidized. Uh, and as the um, uh, governments there are not really, so to say, democratic uh, elected, democratically elected, there might be a threat for them, at least a societal tension, if they are not delivered. And this is something which can immediately create pressure on us, the Europeans. Uh, the Algerians are 40 million people. 35 of them are living on the Mediterranean coast. So if there is an explosion, there would be an immediate impact for us. And therefore, 
we have to address uh, this issue in a much more comprehensive uh, way. Uh, but we have also to acknowledge, uh, and this is why we have to think out of the box, uh, we, we cannot uh, consider that fences and walls might uh, hinder people to come to Europe. Uh, we have to see how we can accommodate with these uh, challenges by investing in these countries, by assisting them uh, to improve uh, their, uh, their living conditions. And for that, for instance, and this is also something different to the very recent development here in the country, we are trying uh, to have uh, far-reaching free trade agreements uh, uh, to realize quick commercial wins for our citizens, but also our neighbors alike. Open markets means open minds. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the most advanced uh, agreements we have reached with our neighbors, with Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, are all in force now and are de facto integrating these countries already into the European market, which is uh, the largest in the world. They have already led to an impressive surge in exports from these countries uh, to the European Union and beyond pure economics, they will also help to vaccinate our friends against outside interventions by others who have a more monopolistic view of the term neighborhood. The next such agreement, uh, especially with Tunisia, uh, is in the pipeline. Another one with Georgian, we have focused our trade measures on regions and sectors with a high refugee population. And with Armenia, we have found a balanced deal uh, that shows we don't consider our neighborhood an exclusive sphere of influence and don't harm rest and, and don't arm wrestle our neighbors into zero-sum games. Europe and its neighborhood are no longer an exclusive playground uh, for big boys, as some seem to believe. In the same, same vein, new growth missions so as European investors deploy the potential of the private sector. Another, so to say, reaction answer to the challenges we are facing in our neighborhood is uh, the creation of the new European investment plan, which just could uh, uh, present in a conference at the margin of the UN General Assembly. I think it was yesterday. Uh, and it will become very soon operational. With EU funding as a backstop guarantee, it will leverage billions of private investment in the source states of migration. So more student and youth exchange, uh, we invest in future generations. And we are launching more funding for startups in the East and the South, in Albania, in Tunisia, Georgia. Again, here is a basic lesson for economic development. The education and technology is there. It's access to capital. That's the problem. A second key point in tackling uh, development challenges in our neighborhood we must, in a way, be more sober and look more to our European interests and those of our partners, rather than assuming that we all agree. Again, we must not practice a mistaken realpolitik uh, that goes into trouble in the first place. I'm not arguing in favor of uh, purely transactional relationships. Deve development is not an experiment in a game theory. But we must acknowledge uh, that our intentions and our donor money alone don't buy us uh, reforms, let alone respect for universal values. You cannot turn on the light uh, of development with the flick of a switch. We can only support reformers where they themselves choose that path and must do so less mechanically with less megaphone diplomacy. <coughs> This is also something one has to understand that sometimes people believe we can move um, people, politicians, uh, like at a chess field. Uh, this is not possible. Um, as uh, we are committed to rule of law, to democracy, we have to respect these procedures and we cannot act different from our fundamentals and principles. And by the way, I believe if we are able to do so and to be successful, the result 
is much more sustainable than the other way around. A test case for this policy, I won't hide it, is Libya, which is currently the main thoroughfare on the central Mediterranean migration route. In addition to pushing forward the political transition, a pretty tall order in itself, we are also frankly adding filters along the migration route. That is why we are working closely with the Libyan authorities to address the issue by reinforcing the role and capacity of its Coast Guard. And, for instance, very specific for this country uh, by improving the perspective of local community, communities. We are working closely with them together, helping them to provide uh, basic services in order to stabilize the situation on the ground and to gradually reach out to other parts of the country. And uh, in that respect, I, uh, it's also important that European countries are working together, pulling at the same string into the same direction. Again, all of these uh, measures can only succeed if they are embedded in a broader approach of development uh, for the local economy. That is the only way of structurally breaking uh, the business model of smugglers who thrive in lawless, hopeless situations. Short-term measures won't do the trick. Let me turn to Syria briefly, this terrible stain on our international conscience. It will not go into the details of the political efforts to resolve the crisis. Let me just say what we can contribute to avoid even worse and strengthen the resilience of the country and its people. Last April, we passed an important milestone with multi-billion pledges at the Brussels Syria conference. The focus was on securing education for all children and livelihood opportunities for refugees and affected communities, as well as uh, promoting basic public services and economic growth. Very good progress has been made on this in an enormously complicated environment. However, we cannot be complacent. We must continue to do our utmost to support people in need, both inside and in the region, for the foreseeable future, precisely because a lasting political solution remains elusive for the time being. Here, stabilization has, unfortunately, a more basic meaning, meaning avoiding the worst. And I have to say, uh, if you take the burden the neighboring countries of Syria are taking, it's unbelievable and remarkable. <clears throat> In Lebanon, which is per se not, so to say, an easy country, the, the number of inhabitants is a little bit more than 4 million people, 4.2. But the number of refugees in the country is another 2 million. So imagine that 50% of a population are refugees. What it means for societies. We have a situation in Lebanon that, already, that there are already more Syrian kids in school than Lebanese kids, at least in public schools. We are working there in two shifts. In the morning, there are the uh, uh, kids, uh, which are taught uh, uh, by um, Lebanese curricula. And in the afternoon, we have the Syrian kids. Uh, There's a heavy burden on everybody, in particular also on the host communities. And it's something one can apparently <coughs> not imagine if every second people is a refugee or a migrant. And uh, this is the situation we are facing in our immediately neighborhood. So I'm more than happy that we are able to finance at least the schooling of uh, uh, young refugees in order to avoid a lost generation. Uh, I was there several times. I was uh, visiting school classes where there were children, uh, one was nine, the other one was 16. But the pity was that the 16-year-old girl was not in school for six or seven years because of the 
uh, security situation. And this is something which stays as a as a um, uh, possible time bomb for the future. Uh, I met uh, two days ago um, Anthony uh, Lake, uh, the, the chief of, uh, uh, or the boss, uh, general secretary of UNICEF, and we talked about this issue. Because the problem is, and this was his point, if somebody experienced not to be educated, he or she believes this might be quite normal with all the consequences for his future life. So not providing something in a time frame when somebody is between 5 and 15 has an impact for the whole life, but has also an impact for the society in which uh, this person is living into the future. And these are things <coughs> which we have to be aware. And when we are talking today about, uh, so say, facing and addressing counterterrorism, radicalization, it's also because these people are the first target for radical elements. And so it's in our own interest, all around the globe, also here in the States, to support and to help uh, these people to be enrolled in schools and to have a proper education. So it's not something which is far away. In terms of kilometers or miles, it's far away. But in terms of concrete consequences, it could be the other day very close to your own doorstep. Um, let me therefore uh, briefly uh, turn to another key player in the region, which might be of interest for you. It's Turkey. Clearly, Turkey is and remains a strategic partner for us, politically and economically, when it comes to managing energy and migration flows. But I am afraid we are not reaching a point of, uh, but we have, I'm afraid that we have already reached a point of uh, no return with Ankara. There can be no more business as usual, in which we simply pretend to believe them about their commitment to join the European Union while events on the ground speak a completely different language. Too much backsliding on key areas of the rule of law and fundamental freedoms has occurred over the last few years, already before the last year's attempted coup. Turkey under President Erdogan is moving away from the European Union with giant steps. That takes a heavy toll on Turkey, its society, and not least its economy, but let, let's not forget this. It's a matter of uh, credibility for the European Union, too. Of course, we should not and we cannot recklessly disengage. That would be short-sighted. Geography is destiny. We continue to share a wide area of mutual interest uh, with Turkey. The real strategic question is thus whether this shared interest and common gains are best pursued in an EU accession context, which is now pretty fictional anyway, given Turkey's choices, or an alternative, more realistic, yet still ambitious and comprehensive uh, setting. This debate is now firmly, uh, in, um, so say, firmly on the agenda inside the European Union, and I would expect uh, first conclusions on this issue after the European Council our leader summit uh, in mid-October. More strategically, this challenge shows two things. First, that uh, the gravi gravitational pull of our union, its power to produce change, its role as a beacon that can literally lighten up political systems and economies can only work if there is a strong local buy-in. In the end, Europe is a choice, not a straitjacket. A second, uh, while we must very smartly use this EU power of attraction, we must not overreach either. A direct accession perspective, the right to join the group uh, once, our, uh, once uh, uh, a candidate country fulfill all membership conditions, is still today a powerful instrument. Hence, it should be handled with great care on both sides. 
that brings me uh, briefly to the Western Balkans. Uh, Professor Hausmann has already spoken about it. Uh, I can only repeat what our President uh, Juncker has uh, just the other week uh, precisely expressed in his uh, speech uh, uh, about the situation in the European Union. All these countries uh, in the Western Balkans have a perspective to join the European Union. If you look already today at the map, all these six countries are already surrounded by EU member states. So it makes uh, a lot of sense that these countries sooner or later should become members of the Union. Also in our own interest because it's still a very fragile, shaky area and uh, to be, so to say, integrated in the European Union um, is, uh, so to say, the best guarantee that uh, the situation in the region becomes much more stable. Finally, but there is one aspect uh, also at the Western Balkan I really want to touch uh, uh, a, little, a little bit and it's like a little footnote uh, for the advocates of international interventionism. Uh, we have, as you know, six countries in the Western Balkans which are, so to say, future uh, members. It's Serbia, it's Bosnia-Herzegovina, Montenegro, Albania, Kosovo, and the, as I have to say, the former uh, Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia. I'm forced to use this uh, long version due to international agreements. But if you look at uh, the six, there are two Balkan countries that still have some international viceroys, meaning uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo, which are not exactly the leaders of the PAC. Uh, they are less advanced than the, two, uh, the four others. What we need here, but also in other countries, is political will instead of uh, political games and real reforms not only on paper, but on the ground, especially in the key areas I mentioned, the rule of law, competitiveness, and connectivity that might endanger the business model of some individuals, but uh, strategically, there is no alternative. Also, this is a challenge, how to gra gradually transform these societies in sustainable, democratic, uh, robust structures. Uh, and this is clearly also linked to individuals and uh, here we are still facing some challenges and we have seen uh, how, how, to, how to say challenging the situation could be if you look at uh, the political situation in the former uh, Yugoslavic Republic of uh, Macedonia where we managed in two to three years to have a real transformation from one government to the other one. Uh, I think I was already too long because I have a little bit uh, elaborated uh, from my uh, briefing. But finally, I wanted uh, to touch one final aspect, which I believe is also important to address it here in the United States. It's important to understand, and I hope that I could uh, explain it a little bit uh, from the point of a European politician, a European official, that the situation in Europe uh, in respect to its neighborhood might be and is definitely different from the perspective, uh, let's say, from the United States. And uh, definitely uh, Europeans, or at least many Europeans, have also a different view about Latin America than probably the US. It always depends on the, so to say, uh, geographic uh, uh, proximity. And this is uh, why it is so important uh, that we push for a peaceful, prosperous and above all sustainable development in our neighborhood um, as I hope uh, to have, uh, um, so to say, convincing uh, explained today because uh, it's uh, the only way for us without, uh, uh, so to say, risking that uh, it is uh, backfiring on us if we are not implementing sustainable changes. We cannot afford quick fixes, although they are often politically tempting, also by some of our leaders. 
we cannot allow ourselves policy making uh, by helicopter flying in, blowing up dust, flying out again, even though that would do well in opinion polls simply because we are talking about our neighbors. In other words, a stronger, confident, more confident, uh, more responsible Europe is an imperative that is uh, partly a matter of resources, but first and foremost, a matter of uh, collective political will. And uh, we are already uh, doing it in most of the Western Balkans as a crisis manager and uh, crisis solver. And we should do it uh, elsewhere too. And uh, this is something where we, the Europeans, have to play a more important role. Um, if I'm looking um, in the magnitude of money we are spending, uh, not only in the neighborhood, uh, we are the biggest uh, donor when it comes to global development aid. Uh, so in that respect, we are a big uh, uh, payer, but Europe is not yet a big player. And this is something we have to change. Uh, this is also something which can only be changed if uh, at least some of our bigger member states are supporting this concept. But it will definitely be, so to say, the future perspective of Europe because there is no other alternative in a more globalized world uh, to act more united and uh, following what you have said, uh, Professor Hausmann, I think the charm and the success of Europe is that indeed we are united in diversity. Thank you very much.